Hello, welcome to the Environmental Update. I'm Brian Hoppe, Chair of the Lower Marion Environmental Advisory Council, or EAC. Throughout the year, we're going to dedicate a portion of each episode to highlight schools within the township that have an outstanding environmental program or curriculum. I'm joined today by Dr. Jeanette Dumas, Assistant Professor of Biology at Rosemont College to learn more about their program. Welcome, Dr. Dumas. I'm delighted to be here. You were recently a recipient of a Lower Marion Township 2018 Go for the Green Award for Education. First of all, congratulations on that. It's Thank very you. well deserved. Can you share with the audience uh, a little information about the environmental curriculum and activities at Rosemont College? Sure, I'd love to. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start with uh, part of our mission statement, which is to care for the earth, our common home. And at Rosemont College, we infuse the mission in everything that we do. So as part of our mission statement, we do have an environmental uh, science curriculum. And I'd like to classify it as being interdisciplinary. And we're able to tailor it to the goals of the students because we are a small college. So there's two ways you can study the environment at college. You can, at Rosemont College, you can be a biology major uh, with an environmental science concentration. And you would take courses such as ecology, evolution, marine biology, environmental science, of course, um, global environmental issues. And I teach a number of those courses. And I believe it's very important for those courses to have a strong field component. And the reason why I feel that way is, first of all, I want kids to get out there and engage in nature, particularly these days. <laughs> and also, um, I want them to see how natural history informs ecology and environmental science. And also, it's important for them to learn the techniques that environmental scientists and ecologists use to answer their, their questions. So we also have an environmental studies major. So kids in the environmental studies major would take more humanities types of courses, mm -hmm. social science types of courses. So these would be things like environmental ethics, uh, environmental history, economics. But because our program is interdisciplinary in nature, this, the students who are in the uh, environmental science concentration as bio majors, they can certainly take the humanities, the non-science types of courses. And students in the environmental studies programs can certainly tailor their program to be, to have more of the science type courses. So uh, we, we like to brag at Rosemont College, mm -hmm. our, our motto is the power of small. Yeah, I've seen that advertisement. Uh, matter of yes. fact, I was coming back from the airport not too long ago. Yes. And your billboards right yes, there. Yes, the power is small. Right. So you've been conducting a long-term ecological study with the undergraduate students on campus in investigating the effects of stormwater runoff. Can you share a little bit of background on that study and, and any of the results if they're available? Sure, I'd love to. So we've been studying the stream on campus for about five years. And when we started the team, um, Five years ago, my students decided to call themselves the stream team, the stream team. instead of the dream team. <laughs> <laughs> and they decided to call me the stream queen. Very nice. So I'm the stream queen. <laughs> Who's the stream king? Uh, we don't have one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you can like us on Facebook. We do have a Facebook page. That was very exciting. So just to give you a little bit of geography, we have a, a small stream on campus. It's a headwater tributary, tributary of Mill Creek. And we also have a headwater section of Mill Creek, and then the two come together, and we call that area the confluence. Okay. So we study the stream, we study the confluence, and specifically what we do is we look at water quality. And the way that we study water quality is to uh, look at uh, variables such as nitrate levels, phosphate levels, dissolved oxygen levels, uh, chloride levels, because those variables uh, can be uh, affected by stormwater runoff. So again, here we're trying to assess the health of the stream. And the other way that we assess the health of the stream is to look at the community of macroinvertebrates in the stream. Uh, that, that tends to give you a longer term signature of what's going on in terms of the, uh, how many pollutants are in the stream. So in terms of the results of our study, a uh, particular concern for us is our low dissolved oxygen levels and our high phosphate levels. And we also see very uh, high peaks of chloride during the winter mm -hmm. when there's heavy precipitation and heavy use of deicers in the area. So we get these really high peaks of chloride levels. Uh, again, this is the stuff that's being carried in, the, in storm water. And our, what we call our macroinvertebrates, the critters that we're looking at in the stream, tells us the same story. 
we have mostly pollution tolerant species. We have very few what we call clean stream insects. I call them the holy trinity. These are the stoneflies, the mayflies, and the caddisflies. We don't we don't see very many many of those. Okay. So our stream essentially is not in the greatest of shape, like many other streams in the Schuylkill River River watershed. Okay. Well, can you provide other examples of how students are engaged with the environment as part of the curriculum? Sure. Uh, so I just mentioned the research that we do. Mm -hmm. So we also do other kinds of research uh, for the environment. We have environmental chemistry and we also have environmental microbiology. So several of my colleagues in the chemistry department, for example, Dr. Shuni Wu, she synth synthesizes nanoparticles and she uses uh, green materials to synthesize her nanoparticles, things like green tea extract and cinnamon. So the idea here is to make nanoparticles but reduce the types of hazardous waste that you uh, produce in the, that you would make in the synth synthesis of that. Also, uh, my colleague Dr. John Elrook, he studies uh, corals and he's looking at ways to make safe uh, sunscreen safe for corals. The other big way that we engage students at Rosemont College in the environmental sciences is to um, have our students attend symposia and also seminars. So we have an ethical institute I'm sorry, we have an Institute for Ethical Leadership and Social Responsibility at the college, and that's directed by my colleague, Dr. Alan Preddy. We had a symposium a couple of years ago entitled Journey to Sustain Sustainability. So students are encouraged to, to attend those. They did, many students attended those. Actually, my stream team had a poster session as part of that symposium. And I think one of the most impactful events at the Ethical Institute has was they showed a movie called The Sun Come Up. Mm -hmm. And this was about the relocation of an island nation on the Cataract Islands, people who had to leave their home. They'd been living there for many, many generations due to rising sea levels because of global climate change. And that had a real impact on the students because global climate change is in the here and the now. It's not something abstract that's going to happen, you know long time from, from now. Right. So that had a huge impact on them. So another way that we engage students in the environment, I already mentioned the strong field component, is yep. to do project-based learning. And that's where you give students the projects and you say, go figure it out. So for example, I had students in my ecology course survey the health of the campus trees and also to document what we call phenology or seasonal changes, changes in leaf color, leaf drop times, with the idea, the overarching idea, that they would then go to the primary literature and see how that, if that's, uh, if there are any trends in terms of how those things might be changing with climate change. So again, the idea that natural history informs environmental science. Right. Another great project that was done by some of my colleagues, Dr. Adam Lusk and Dr. John Ulrich, they co-teach a politics of sustainability course, and they were working with corals. And what they did was they adopted their, uh, their, their project for corals for, un for undergraduates. They, they, they ad adapted it to uh, work in a K-8 classroom. And then some education majors actually implemented those lesson plans in first grade. So we also care about the younger generation. So just to sum up then, our environmental program is interdisciplinary. It's collaborative. I think that best describes what we do at Rosemont College. It's the power of small. That's great. Well, I understand that you sponsor a student environmental club on campus called Rose Grow. Yes. Okay, so Rose Grow was started by Joseph. He was an environmental studies major, and uh, uh, Joseph is a, a mover and a shaker, and his vision for the club was to raise awareness, but also to act on it. So the whole concept of thinking globally and, and acting locally. So I'll never forget the time that Joseph looked at me and he said, he said, Dr. Dumas, he said, I know the stream is polluted, but what are we going to do about it? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, Joseph, it's a complicated problem. Uh, the other vision that he had for the club was for students to make friends and, and do something good for the environment. Excellent. Excellent. Well, what other things has Rosemont College done to improve the environment on campus or locally? Okay, well, we are building a new community center, which is going to be at the Leeds Silver level. And a lot of our buildings are old on campus, and we are updating our infrastructure, mostly our HVAC, so that we meet Energy Star requirements. Uh, that's excellent. Yeah. That's excellent. So you're a member of the Catholic Climate Covenant Committee. Correct. What is the committee's purpose and goals? Okay, so it's a national organization, 
and uh, the national organization is for members, uh, uh, members and other institutions that are part of the Catholic Church. Again, the mission to care for the earth. So specifically at Rosemont College, we discuss how are we going to become more sustainable. And it's a wonderful committee to be on. I, I love being on it. I learn a lot. We have people on the committee from all different, I'll say that represent all different groups on campus. So faculty, uh, President Sharon Hirsch is on the committee, ministry, Sister Jean Marie Hatch, she chairs the committee. We have the directors of facilities, dining services, residence life, and students from Rosegrove. So we get all kinds of perspectives. And it, it's, it's great. Um, I, I've really learned a lot because there's, something, there's things that, that somebody in dining services is going to think about that I'm not necessarily going to think about. Right. So environmental issues are complex, so we need that, that we need everybody's perspective on it. So some of our projects, well, one of our most recent projects, we have a long list. One of our most recent projects was uh, to reduce plastic uh, bottles, water bottles on campus. And to do that, we installed a hydration station so people just reuse their container mm -hmm. instead of just one use, throw out the bottle type thing. We also have Recycle Mania, which encourages the students to recycle whatever they can. And whoever participates the most in the Recycle Mania, whatever dorm, it's by dorm, gets a pizza party type of thing. Uh, we, we have a lot of other goals. And as Joseph was saying, what are we going to do about it? That's one of our goals, is how are we going to manage our stormwater impact? So in the, the study that you're conducting, um, and you mentioned you have a, a tributary and you have Mill Creek coming in. Are you seeing any differences between the two in terms of water quality or uh, the macro not really. invertebrates? No, not really. Okay. Very similar. Okay. Well, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, you'll be able to really uh, get the grounds maintenance teams and and everybody and students on board to help clean up those two streams. Well, that's the idea. Excellent. That's the idea. Well, thank you, Dr. Dumas, for sharing such great stuff about uh, the the Rosemont College program, the environmental curriculum, and the different programs that that you have there on campus. I'd like to add one more thing. Okay. I might have mentioned this before. So we are a small liberal arts college, but our, our size doesn't uh, limit us. In fact, I think it enriches us because it allows us to be very collaborative. Great. Well, thank you again. Thank you. When we come back, we'll hear from Amanda Meltz, who is spearheading an initiative in Lower Marion to keep birds safe. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Environmental Update. I'm here with Amanda Meltz, a Lower Marion resident, undertaking an effort to raise awareness on bird collisions with buildings, the number one cause of mortality for birds in North America. Welcome, Amanda. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, you're very welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about the Bird Safe Initiative? I can. Um, so I grew up watching birds and loving birds, and then I even went to school and studied wildlife, and then I was an environmental science teacher, and I taught about birds and I never even knew about this topic. Um, and then back in December, I went and I saw Dr. Daniel Clem speak, who's a professor of ornithology at Muhlenberg College, and he talked about this issue, and I just realized what a huge impact um, bird window collisions are having on birds. So I decided to uh, start an initiative here in Lower Marion to raise awareness about the topic. Excellent, excellent. So what are the reasons that birds fly into glass? That's a great question. So birds and people and most animals actually don't have the ability to see glass. So they either think um, it's just a clear surface that they can fly right through, or they see a reflection and think it's actually an inviting habitat that they might be able to fly into, um, which sadly ends in them hitting the glass. <laughs> and you know how that goes from there. <laughs> so, so how big is the bird window bird building collision problem? The problem is really big. Um, it's actually wiping out one billion birds per year in the United States. And I don't think many people realize how big this topic really is, which is why I wanted to bring it to everyone's attention. So um, in the United States, there are about 10 billion birds. So 10% of that number are actually wiped out through collisions with glass. Just with glass. Just with glass. 
every year. And that year. doesn't count the, the predators or anything else, just Right, so the birds are facing so many obstacles, cats, habitat destruction, pollution, and then here's one that we can fix, which is why I love this topic. So if we're losing so many birds, yeah. um, what impact does that really have in our lives? So well, why should, why should our residents care? Right. So um, as I say, like birds are always among us, but never really with us. So they're doing all these things that you and I aren't even aware of. Um, so for instance, birds do a lot of seed dispersal. So a lot of our trees are totally dependent on birds in order to disperse their seeds or to make new trees. Um, birds do a lot of pollination of our crops. So a lot of our crops are dependent on birds. Birds, a, a big thing birds do, something that um, we don't really want to have to do is clean up carcasses. Mm. So vultures have such a major um, impact on our ecosystem because they go around and they clean up carcasses and they take care of a lot of rotting things that we don't have to deal with. Right. Um, so if we were to remove birds from a lot of these situations, we would, it would cost us billions of dollars. So are there any solutions available to homeowners or businesses uh, in Lower Marion? There are. I also wanted to mention one more thing that okay. I forgot to mention was that birds um, have a huge economic value to us. Um, billions of dollars are spent by bird watchers like myself uh -huh. <laughs> on equipment and on ecotourism and things like that. So, so they're really great for our economy as well. Right. So what about the solutions? What can we do? That's a great question. So. Um, the solutions are easy, which is why I love this topic. We don't have to um, solve global warming. We just have to fix our windows, um, and it's not that hard to do. So I'll show you what I love, um, which are the residential solutions that I brought here. Um, I brought two products that I really, really like. Um, the first product I brought is something called Feather Friendly Bird Tape. Um, this is a product that's made in Toronto. Uh, so it's pretty easy. It's do-it-yourself. You start by putting um, two tape measures on your window. This all comes in with our neat little package. Full disclosure, I do not make any money from these <laughs> products. Um, when you put the tape on, you pull the tape off, and it leaves behind these little adhesives. Um, they're barely noticeable when they're on your window at home, which is something I love about them. And I, I think they look actually pretty neat. There's another product made here in the United States that's called Kaleidoscape. Um, and they make films that you can actually put on your window. So I have this on the exterior of my big bay window at the front of my house, which was causing a lot of bird collisions. Um, I like this clear one. You put it on, make sure they go on the outside surface of your window to break up any reflection. Uh, you put this clear film on, leave it on, and then it, it, it almost just looks like a, your window's a little bit more cloudy, but it creates enough of a pattern that the birds pick it up and then they don't collide anymore. And have you noticed any difference from before you had that oh, film yes. on until after? Absolutely, yeah. I don't have any birds hitting my windows anymore. All right. The products are very effective. Um, most of them are so easy to do yourself. They're inexpensive. Uh, it's a very small sacrifice that we can make to help um, preserve some birds. So you had a, um, uh, an informational session at Suburban Square recently. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we do. We met at Common Space. I had Professor Daniel Clem come to speak, who is, um, he's sort of the man that first identified this as the problem that it is. So he wrote, he started studying this 40 years ago and has dedicated his life to getting this issue known. And then he was the first to really identify the, the sheer number of birds that are getting killed this way. So he came and spoke and we had some local residents come out. Um, I demoed these products and then um, we have some people fixing their windows, which is saving birds, and that's a great thing. That's great, and and um, you know we, a couple uh, of the members of the EAC, attended a similar seminar down in the city of Philadelphia, okay. and and what the speaker uh, informed us of was is the history of City Hall, and when it was first constructed, um, you know it was, you know, it, it is a beautiful, a building. It's a it's a masterpiece in architecture. They had these floodlights illuminating the mm -hmm. entire and surrounding the entire building. And because, and they had a massive beacon going up into yeah. the sky. And because of that, at night, all these birds were being attracted right. to the building and running into the building. Um, and after a short bit of, of time, they decided to remove those lights uh, from City Hall and save countless numbers of birds. So. You mentioned, you know, other challenges that we, we have with birds, uh, with, with cats and, and with other predators. 
Um, do you have any idea of uh, how that compares to bird collisions in terms of, of bird mortality? I do. So cats, I would say right now, the scientific community thinks cats take out about the same number, uh, one billion birds per year, mm. which is a massive number. But um, new research is showing that perhaps cats are very smart and they're getting, they're hearing the thump, you know, that horrible thump when a bird hits a window, and then they're honing in on the area where it hits and coming over and getting those birds. So actually, it may be even the windows that are causing a lot of those cat mortalities. Interesting. Yes. Very interesting. Isn't that interesting? That is, that is, that is very and interesting. And this is why you're wondering, a billion birds, why aren't I seeing littered birds everywhere? That's because a lot of times predators are very keen and they pick them up, or the birds are able to fly off into a concealed area for a little bit before they, they, um, before they die. unfortunately mm -hmm. pass away. All right. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the audience? Um, yes, I'd like to say thank you so much for hearing me about this topic. And I really appreciate that. And, and if we can just do one little sacrifice in our life and save at least one bird from today, I would be so thankful. Thank you for your time today, Amanda. It's been great. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Dumas and Amanda Meltz for joining us today and for sharing uh, such great information about the environmental programs at Rosemont College and on the Bird Safe, Safe Initiative. When we come back, I'll go over an outstanding workshop the EAC recently hosted in conjunction with the Lower Marion Conservancy. Please stay tuned. Welcome back. I'm Brian Hoppe, Chair of the Lower Marion EAC. On Tuesday, September 25th, 2018, the EAC and Lower Marion Conservancy hosted a sustainability workshop. Back in April 2018, the EAC presented an environmental action plan to the Board of Commissioners. The plan is ambitious and contains numerous initiatives that will guide the EAC's activities for the next five years. The plan builds on the Township's environmental achievements and pushes us further in taking a leadership position in addressing the environmental concerns that we all face. One of the plan's initiatives recognizes the need to increase the township's resiliency, further improve environmental quality, and develop a more holistic approach with regards to sustainability within the township. More importantly, we feel it is necessary for maintaining a healthy community for generations to come, and that a more coordinated approach with wide-based community support is necessary. That served as the driving force to conduct the sustainability workshop. I would like to thank my fellow EAC member, David Richmond, and one of the township's senior planners, Andrea Campisi, for all of their hard work in organizing the event and for assembling so many great speakers and panelists. The workshop was recorded and will air on LMTV throughout the fall. I hope that you're available to take some time to view the presentations and discussions and to learn more about the various aspects of sustainability. The workshop served as a launching point for a much broader conversation about how Lower Marion can meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Look for an upcoming sustainability planning event soon. Well, that does it for the fall edition of the Environmental Update. Thank you for joining us. I hope that you enjoyed today's program. If you have any suggested topics for future episodes or have a question on an environmental issue, please email us at the address below. Thank you and see you again in the winter.